De La Soul's debut album, Three Feet High and Rising, is a landmark album for multiple reasons. It introduced De La's unique style of hip-hop to the world, took sampling to a new level, and had a massive influence on so much music that's been made since. But within this landmark album, there's also tragedy. The very thing that is so groundbreaking is also the thing that nearly erased De La Soul from music history entirely. Today we're talking all about the classic album Three Feet High and Rising by De La Soul, how it was made, why it's such an important album, the tragedy behind it, but also how this album is about to make history all over again, being reborn for a new generation. First, let's talk about why this album is such a big deal. On the musical side, let's condense some history. Hip hop starts in the early 70s with a simple concept. This drum break feels good, let's figure out a way to loop that. The MC for the party eventually starts rapping over it, got it. Through the 80s, the drum machine takes over, Roland 808, etc. And then in the second half of the 80s, we have the rise of samplers. This circles back on the original concept, this drum break feels good, but lets you build on it. Now you can loop one sample, bring another sample in, play that, layer things on top, etc. For the sake of time, I'm shortening the history, but this is the general idea. So sampling is getting more popular. James Brown releases the Funky Drummer bonus beat reprise in 1986, which is just a loop of the drum break. I think he was trying to get sampled, but that's in a different video. Anyway, the point is, in the late 80s, we've hit a point where producers are using samplers more and more and starting to push the limits of what's possible, sampling funk and soul records and making new music out of it. And then we get to 1989. De La Soul's Three Feet High uses extensive sampling. We're talking over 60 samples on this album. Some are layered on top of each other or scratched on top, all combining to make something new, fresh, and unlike anything that had been previously made. De La Soul members Posthenus, Maceo, and Dave, aka Trugoy the Dove, and producer Prince Paul were constantly trying to outdo each other with their samples, bringing in more records, adding them all together, and having a ton of fun in the process. As Posthenus recalled, Ideas came quickly. We were mixing three songs a day, all egging each other on. It was playful, childlike fun. At no point did we think what we were doing would end up being so revolutionary. The Beastie Boys reportedly listened to Three Feet High while they were finishing their own sample-heavy album from 1989, Paul's Boutique, and nearly started over from scratch. Fellow Native Tongues members, a tribe called Quest, took inspiration from this production, building on it, polishing it, making it their own, leading to albums like People's Instinctive Travels in 1990 and the classic album The Low End Theory from 1991. In short, Three Feet High pushed sample-based music to a new level. On the lyrical side, this album is such a big deal because De La Soul was a member of the Native Tongues, a collective of hip-hop artists like the Jungle Brothers, Tribe, Black Sheep, Queen Latifah, and many more that were a more positive, Afrocentric alternative scene when harder gangster rap was sweeping the nation. I've covered this much more in depth in my video on the Native Tongues, which I'll link to at the end of this video. From these two angles, Three Feet High and Rising came at the right place at the right time. It's a different kind of hip hop than gangsta rap, but it's also not even trying to compete. And it's pushing production to new levels. It's made by a bunch of teenagers having fun and not worrying too much about what hip hop is supposed to be. And it sounds like it. But within this incredible landmark album lies the tragedy. Actually, no, I don't wanna bring it down just yet. Let's stay on the positive. What else is great about this album? The first song on the album is The Magic Number, which samples, of all things, Schoolhouse Rock. While other artists are sampling James Brown or Roy Ayers or other classic artists, De La Soul starts off with sampling a kid's song. I love it. Immediately they're establishing themselves as different. To be fair, this song still samples the funky drummer, but just the count off. But this song alone has many different samples, from the Fatback Band to Johnny Cash, which is actually where the name of the album comes from. Johnny Cash's song is Five Feet High and Rising, and the album is, well, you already know. This is another thing that's so unique about this album. It's not just the extensive use of sampling, it's the types of samples used. Records for kids, Johnny Cash, or in the case of the song I Know, the song samples Sly and the Family Stone, Otis Redding, and Steely Dan. The primary sample on the song Say No Go is I Can't Go For That by Hall & Oates. Johnny Cash, Steely Dan, Hall & Oates. These aren't the typical types of artists you'd sample. They've also got plenty of classic soul and funk samples, but what I'm getting at is all of these artists are outside Inside the typical sampling pool. My point in bringing this up is that it allows for two things. For one, in 1989 when N.W.A. is sweeping the nation, getting huge pushback for their violent lyrics and aggressive sounding music, this album is accessible to a broader audience. I'm not saying one's better than the other, just if the options are the police or a song that, huh, 
That sounds like Daryl Hall and John Oates. Well, maybe hip hop isn't all bad after all. Hip hop's not a monolith. There's room for a lot of different styles. It's good to have options. Tommy Boy label head Tom Silverman explained this further when he said, aside from the US, that album was also important because it was the first hip hip hop album on the international scene. It was the first album to do more than 500,000 units in Europe, way more than even Run DMC. Musically, it was just more accessible to people over there who were rock and roll fans. It just wasn't seen as a dark American rap record. The other thing this allows for is the opening of the sampling floodgates. You can sample James Brown, Sly, Steely Dan, Fatback Band, Johnny Cash, the Detroit Emeralds, or a song made for children all on the same album. Sample whoever you want. As long as it's cool and it's got something you want, go for it. Bo Diddley? Go for it. The Commodores? Get in here, guys! The Turtles? Well, God, this brings us down again. On the song Transmitting Live from Mars, De La sampled the Turtles, and due to a miscommunication or whatever, it didn't get cleared ahead of time. The Turtles sued for, get this, $2.5 million. And that's 2.5 in 1991 money, which adjusted for inflation is roughly like, what, like 80 bajillion, I think? They settled out of court for less than that, but come on. Of course, that doesn't even compare to the real tragedy that happened later, but I don't want to go there yet. Let's let's bring it back up. Skits! Love them or hate them, Three Feet High pioneered the hip-hop skit. The album even opens with a skit before the first song, introducing the members of the group like they're on a game show. Sure, it's kind of a silly idea, but that's the point. Redefining what a hip-hop album can be. It can just be a lot of fun. After the songs were all recorded, everybody picked a day, got together, and improvised some skits. They're silly, they're ridiculous, and it sounds like a bunch of teenagers just having fun. Because that's what it is. It breaks up the record and makes the whole thing feel less like this big thing that has to be taken very seriously. It can just be fun. And between the skits, samples, and verses they lay on top, the whole thing does just feel very fun and lighthearted. As Dave, aka True Boy the Dove, put it, it was a capsule of our innocence. I can hear four individuals who didn't give a damn about the rules and just went in and had a good time. Speaking of a good time, there's the song Me, Myself, and I. If you only know one De La Soul song, it's probably this. In fact, it was the second ever number one song on the Billboard Hot Rap Songs chart. That chart was started in March of 1989. After most of the songs were completed for the album, their label, Tommy Boy, asked them for one more song. Something radio-friendly that could be the entry point into the album. They sampled Parliament's 1979 song, Not Just Knee Deep, combining it with a few other samples, including Rapper Dapper Snapper by Edwin Birdsong from 1980. By the way, Edwin Birdsong, he's so important, I already made a video on him too. It gets a little crazy. But there was another thing with this song. The group kind of hated it. It was a huge hit for De La Soul and put them on the map, but they would still introduce the song at live shows by getting the crowd to chant, We hate this song. Me, Myself, and I wasn't the only thing about Three Feet High that De La hated. Due to their more positive sounding music and way of dressing, the label leaned in hard and branded them as sort of hip hop hippies, leading to the iconic album cover, which the band also kinda hated. This is why their next album is called De La Soul Is Dead with dying flowers spilling out of a cracked flower pot. <sighs> Doing it again and bringing the whole video down. We're not even at the real tragedy yet. I'm sorry, I can turn this around, at least for a little while longer. It wasn't all bad. In more recent years, De La Soul has looked back on this album very positively as some of their best work and just so much fun to make. Pause the news recalled. DJ Quick has a theory that when you record on two inch magnetic tape, the tape picks up the energy in the room so it ends up on the actual recording. We can now do great things with digital, but I think on that first album, you can really hear all the fun we had. Remember how I mentioned the native tongues earlier? The song Buddy features the Jungle Brothers and Q-Tip from A Tribe Called Quest, but then the remix, The Native Tongue's Decision, adds even more members from the collective. Queen Latifah, Moni Love, and Fife Dog from Tribe. This is the most Native Tongues members on one song, and it's a classic. It's like a time capsule of not only Three Feet High, but the Native Tongues as a whole, showing how cool the whole thing was and how different it was from so much other music at the time. So, man, this album is so good. Besides the small hiccups of the Turtles lawsuit or the fact that De La hated their biggest song on the album, it's a landmark album. It's a Native Tongues classic. It's so much fun. There's skits, there's wide-ranging samples, which opened up the possibilities, inspiring many producers and artists for years to come. How could this possibly be bad? Where could the tragedy be? Well, the tragedy is this album, in fact, De La Soul's first six albums, have almost been erased from music history entirely. When the samples were cleared in 1989, the music world looked a lot different than it does today. Back then, it was all physical media like tapes, CDs, and vinyl. Today, it's mostly streaming and digital purchases. And the samples were only cleared for the physical releases, so they never made the jump to digital. Worse yet, some of the clearances were apparently handshake deals that would come back to bite the label Tommy Boy Records. 
I'm not even gonna go into all the detail because it's boring and so stupid. Basically, the labels could never figure it out. Warner was in charge of the catalog for a while, but did nothing with it. They never made it available on streaming or digital downloads and stopped pressing the physical copies, even when the album was accepted into the Library of Congress for being a notable and significant work in music history. In 2019, Tommy Boy got the catalog back and announced that it was finally gonna be available on streaming soon. But De La Soul then let everyone know how unfair the deal was. Tommy Boy Records was going to take 90% of the royalties and De La Soul would get 10. Tommy Boy quickly reversed course and then the catalog remained in limbo. This is the big tragedy of Three Feet High and Rising. It's such a landmark album and yet one of the big reasons why it's such a big deal, the extensive use and expansion of sampling, is also the thing that kept it from being heard by modern ears. For years, there's been a giant gap in music history. No streaming, no digital, no new physical purchases at all. That's crazy for an album this iconic. In fact, there's such a tight lock on this music, it's not just the absence from streaming. If I put any song from Three Feet High in this video, YouTube blocks the entire thing and you wouldn't be able to see any portion of it. I love breaking down beats in these videos, so I tried hard to get around this. Putting the actual song in gets a block, but what about recreating it? I remade the beat for me, myself, and I, as well as Buddy, but YouTube thinks it's the De La Soul song and then puts a full block on it. The lock on this music is so tight, I can't even recreate my own version of it. This is ridiculous, but wait. There is some good news. In 2021, Reservoir Media bought the group's master recordings, and I don't know what they did, but they figured it out. And today, March 3rd, 2023, 34 years to the day after the release of Three Feet High, De La Soul's entire discography is finally available on streaming, digital, and they've even repressed the physical copies. This is a huge deal. Most stuff is on streaming, but De La Soul's discography is probably the most important music that hasn't been on there. And we've got some catching up to do. Look, at Christmas last year, we tried to get Donny Hathaway's This Christmas to go number one by streaming an 80-hour Spotify playlist of just that song. We're not gonna do that this time, but please, go listen to De La Soul. Go listen to Three Feet High. Listen to De La Soul is Dead or Stakes is High. Go stream. With the re-release of these classic albums, Three Feet High especially, we have a unique opportunity. This album is being reborn into the digital age and it's our job to spread it far and wide. And tragically, truly tragically, on February 12th, 2023, Dave, AKA Trugoy the Dove passed away, less than a month before the historic re-release of these albums. Rest in peace, Dave. De La Soul is a legendary group that pushed hip hop and all music further in new directions, and we owe it to them to stream these albums, catch ourselves up, and get them as much attention as possible now that they've been unlocked for modern ears. Go stream De La Soul. Can we, can we zoom this in? Buy a vinyl. Go stream De La Soul. Earlier, I mentioned the Native Tongues Collective, which De La Soul was a part of and included other groups like the Jungle Brothers and A Tribe Called Quest. They were a breath of fresh air for a lot of people and it influenced a ton of music that came after. In that video, I also covered the formation of De La Soul, teaming up with producer Prince Paul and how they fit into the larger Native Tongues scene. And for that whole story, you gotta watch this video. 